And so let me start out with what I've been doing just recently. In the last two and a half weeks, three, three weeks now, I have read... The, the transcripts, every word uttered in an official Federal Reserve meeting from the year 2008, okay? Now, just so you know, these transcripts are released, the verbatim transcripts are released five years after the, the year is over. So we just got the 08, uh, 49 weeks from now we'll get the 09. But I read, it's 559,000 words. Put that in perspective, it's, the, the Old Testament is 593,000 words, all right? In the Old Testament, we, you know, we built, we, the universe was created, we wandered around in the desert for 40 years, the earth flooded, you know, all, a lot of stuff, ha I mean, so the, literally the Fed, that's how much they talk, all right? <laughs> and and, and, and I, wanna, I want to start there because my belief is that, is that most people's view of the economy today, and especially financial markets, is influenced, I think, to too great of an extent by what happened in 2008. If you really think about it, it was trauma. I love good words. Trauma is a great word. It was a traumatic event. I mean, you remember it, stocks going down, bonds going down, gold went down, oil went down, the value of your house went down, doesn't matter where you lived, all right? Everything went down. Everyone in this room at some point in that winter sat down with their spouse. Remember that you remember the conversation. Honey, at least we have each other. Because <laughs> that's it, all right? And even if we have some left today, we won't tomorrow. It was traumatic. And my view is that what we have taken away from that is, is a view of the world I personally think is wrong. Well, we've taken something else away from, uh, from it, and that is we have post-traumatic stress disorder. All right? And I'm not making fun of that. I've never been to war myself. I, I, I don't have a family member that's been to war. I, I'm not a psychologist. But post-traumatic, the only experience I ever had with, with, with what I think was PTSD was on a golf course, believe it or not, back in the 1980s. We picked up these two guys I didn't know. A helicopter flew right over us on the 8th tee, and somebody thought it was funny to yell, incoming. And one of the guys that we picked up hit the dirt. And I don't mean hit the dirt. He hugged the earth. It was, it, his reaction scared me. All right, and, and then he got up, dusted himself off, picked up his bag, and left. In my mind, that's PTSD, okay? What, that, that wherever his mind was transported at that moment, he was scared for his life, he was, he was shaken to his core, and he didn't know what to do with himself. He, he left, all right? And isn't that the way investing has felt in the last five years? You know, I assume you wouldn't be here unless you cared about economics or investing. You know, uh, obviously you care about Ashland and Ashbrook. But, but what I mean is, is to listen to somebody talk about this stuff. I, I sort of, we all have a front row seat to this in a way. I do TV. It's, it's not, there's nothing spectacular about it. It's just, it's TV. That's it. But I remember a few times over the past few years, and I think it describes what, we've, what we're living through. I, I, August of 09, maybe it was July of 09. So if you remember, the market bottomed in March of 2009. It was up about, it, it went up real strongly, like right away after the bottom. And, and so they have me on, on CNBC, I get my little earpiece in. I think that guy Noriel Rubini was on right before me, okay? So I don't know if you remember him, but they were asking him what's going on. And, you know, he's, market's up, Noriel. You know, what do you think? He goes, oh, this is a dead cat bounce. It cannot last. The, the world is coming to an end any day now. And, 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 and the market's going to go back down. And they're like, he, they called him Dr. Doom. And they're like, you are a genius. You're brilliant. Thank you for coming on our show. We're so happy that you were here. I, I wish you didn't have to go because now we got that Westbury guy. All right. And so, so then they come to me and they're like, what do you think? And I'm like, I, I think, you know, the economy is going to recover. I'm not, it's not going to boom. I think the market's really cheap. I think we're going to be okay. And then they drop the bomb on me. They, they, what about 
Dubai. Now think about that question for a second. I'm like, you mean where it is? Is this, <laughs> is this a geography test? Is like, I, I'm like, no, everybody knew what they meant. Dubai was in financial trouble, and if they went down, they'd be like a domino, and they'd knock all the other dominoes down, and we were the last domino, and we would go back into 2008. The trauma, right? That's what they meant. And I'm like, look, Dubai is teeny, it's really, really small, we're big, America is strong, like, we'll be okay. And, and then my three minutes were up, all right, boom. So a couple months later, they call me back, and they say, I, I remember Mary says, they want you on Tuesday, and I'm like, Mary, they're going to tell me how right I was about Dubai. I went to the bathroom, I was practicing being humble in the mirror, you know, I, I, I was ready for this. I went on air and they didn't mention Dubai once. And I want you to think about that over the last five years, how many things have been going to take us out and then they don't take us out and then they never talk about them again. They didn't come back and say, well, this is why Dubai didn't take us out. They didn't come back and say, well, we were wrong. They, didn't, they just ignore it. They just move on to the next thing. So now I'm on the air. They, what do you think's going on? I, think, I said, I think the market's cheap. I think we're going to keep growing. It's early 2000. And they're like, what about the BP oil spill? I'm like, you don't know where that is either? Like, <laughs> like, I, I'm like, look, I, 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 I've never been a mile deep in the Gulf. I, I, I mean, I, I'm on CNBC, I'm like, have any of you, like, you anchors, you're acting like you have? They've now, by the way, every anchor on TV has flown a 777 Boeing jet, too. But nonetheless, they, they, I'm like, I'm, I'm like w they're going to plug the thing. I, you know, I'm sure there's a plumber working on it right now, all right? <laughs> And, and I will be all right. And, and, so the, and this has gone on for five years. Fiscal cliffs, sequesters, debt downgrades, tapering, not tapering, more QE, not enough QE, all right? Greece, Italy, Spain, Portugal, Ukraine, on and on and on. So the last time I was on, they were like, what about Cyprus? I'm like, here we go again. It's tiny. It's really, really small. Actually, I want to tell you what I said on air. I, I, I still kind of can't believe I said this, but I'm, I'm like, look, we did the work. The economy of Cyprus is exactly the same size as the economy of Green Bay, Wisconsin. I said, I live in Chicago. Most people here really don't care what happens to Green Bay. It's a football joke, all right? All right, we do. We care about the people. They're really nice, all right, but their football team can go. Anyway, he, and they, they were like, did he just say that? And, and I, 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 my whole point, yeah, I think you get it, is that this nonsense that we've lived through for the past five years is all because of the trauma and what we were told about that winter of 08. And what I believe about that winter, I'm gonna just cut to the chase here and, I wanna, and then I'm gonna try and prove it a little bit, is that it was never as bad as people thought it was. That if you add up all the subprime loans that were made, and, and I, there were subprime loans made that did not stand a chance of staying whole for 30 days. There were people that lied. They didn't have a job, but they said they made 80 grand last year. They, they signed a mortgage. They borrowed money. They didn't have a chance to make the first payment. All right? And, and, and I guarantee you there were loans made like that. We all know it. But when you add it all up, when you add up all of those bad loans, it was about $400 billion. And the economy was $15 trillion, and private citizens in America today have $200 trillion of assets. Back then, had about $180 trillion worth of assets. So I'm sorry, $400 billion is a lot of money, but it's tiny compared to the size of the economy and the tiny size of the assets. It never was going to take down the U.S., ever. What caused the problem to become bigger is, a, is an accounting rule. And I know this is, like, you came to a lunch to hear it about an accounting rule. Oh, great, all right? It's called mark-to-market accounting. And mark-to-market accounting hasn't been around since 1938. We 
ended it. FDR actually ended mark-to-market accounting in 1938. It made its comeback in November of 2007, and the minute we brought it back, we went into a traumatic financial crisis. And what's wrong with mark-to-market accounting is really very simple. All you have to do in mark-to-market accounting is to call up three traders and get three bids, and then you take the price of the bid, and that's what the value of the asset is. All right? The problem is, is when there's no market, when markets dry up and become illiquid, the prices for assets do not resemble what they're really worth. And so what we did is we took a $400 billion problem, and because markets became illiquid, we turned it into a trillions of dollar problem. And then, instead of trying to to fix the accounting rule, instead of fixing the accounting rule, instead we came up with all these government programs to fill the hole that mark-to-market accounting was making in balance sheets. Okay, and so let me put some numbers uh, sort of on this or a, or, or a model so that you can sort of understand this. Mar- a mortgage-backed security, okay, we take a thousand mortgages, we package them all up into one security, and then we sell pieces of it. So forget about all the details, it's just a thousand mortgages in one bond, okay? Let's say 300 of those mortgages go bad, all right, 30% of them. Bad. People stop paying. They're in default. They're, they're, these people are bankrupt. You, if you're a bank, you got a problem. They're not paying on their asset. But the other 700 are still paying. So you have 1,000 mortgages. 70% of them are paying. What's that bond worth? On a cash flow basis, because 70% of them are still paying, it's worth at least 70 cents on the dollar. Okay, because 70% are still paying. Now, by the way, of the 300 mortgages that went bad, you're going to recover something. You're going to sell the house, and maybe it's 40 cents on the dollar. So you should add that back in, too. But forget that. It's worth 70 cents. But in, in, in 2008 and early 2009, there was no market. People wouldn't touch mortgage-backed securities. So guess what the bid was for those securities? 10 cents. So now what the bank is forced to do with mark-to-market Uh, uh, accounting rules is to price that asset at 10 cents even though it's paying 70 cents. And that difference, that hole in the balance sheet is what the government was trying to fill. That's why it invented quantitative easing. That's why it invented TARP. That's why it invented all those programs because it was trying to fill that hole. Now, there's not enough time today to go into this, but there's no way the government could have filled that hole. Because in a mark-to-market accounting world, once you get started spiraling downward, you never stop until all the leverage is out of the system completely, okay? It would never end. So, so as long as mark-to-market accounting was in place, it, it would never end. And, and here's, a, here's, a, here's a perfect chart of what I'm talking about.